High Point University Presents, A Conversation with Wolf Blitzer and Nito Cobain, is a production of UNC-TV in association with High Point University. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a tradition on the campus of High Point University that we expose our students to thought leaders from across America and the world, people in politics, people in business, people in innovation. We believe that holistic education is at the heart of all that we do, that it is, in fact, important to be in the classroom, but it is of equal importance that we enlighten our students with the world at large so that they can become ready to go on and meet the demands of the world as it is going to be. It is in that spirit today that we are welcoming a special person to this campus, and it's my privilege to introduce him. You know this guy, you know his face, you know his name, and um, he is the, uh, the program leader on the Situation Room on CNN. You see him about five days a week, and today, Somebody else is filling in for him on CNN so he can be with all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> welcome, Wolf. Good to have you at High Point University. Thank you very much. So we are delighted to have you at High Point University. Uh, this is a place that we welcomed a lot of people, some of your friends, uh, people who have a lot to say, people who have been around the world as you have, people whose life story is intriguing, interesting, and challenging in many ways to our students and to our parents and to the community at large, and I'm delighted to see you here. I suspect most of our viewers here today uh, have seen you on television, on the Situation Room for sure, which is what, a two-hour program? Yes, it's on Monday through fr Friday, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern. Eastern, <laughs> Eastern. yes. Uh, but, but you don't air Western? Uh, it, it would be three hours earlier. <laughs> okay, <Western>. all right. <laughs> so um, it's got to be challenging to prepare for a program that's two hours long every day. Let us in on how does that work? Well, right now, I'm on the air not just from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm on the air also from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. We have a show uh, at 1 o'clock every day, Monday through Friday. It's called Wolf. I don't know how they came up with that name, <laughs> but uh, my attitude is if there can be a, a network called Fox, there can be a show called <laughs> Wolf. <laughs> so, okay. so, um, so that show is on at 1 o'clock, uh, and that show is also simulcast on CNN International. So it's 1 p.m. in Washington, but it's 6 p.m. in London, 7 p.m. in Paris, 8 p.m in Tel Aviv, 9 p.m. in Moscow. Uh, it's seen live around the world. It's in China. It's 1 a.m. in Beijing. So people are awake in the Western Hemisphere, all over the world, in Africa, Asia, uh, Europe, the Middle East. And so we have a huge audience uh, ar around the world. This was Ted Turner's vision so many years ago when he founded CNN uh, on June 1st, 1980. Uh, he thought that there should be a 24-7 cable news network but it shouldn't just be in the United States, it should be seen all over the world. And you know, he had a vision and he delivered. Yes, he did. Just let us in on your life a little bit. What time do you get up in the morning? Uh, when do you go to work? Uh, you don't spend any time shaving, right? So I, that saves you. Well, you know, it's, it's not exactly precise because I do shave underneath here, <laughs> if, if you want all the details. Okay. And, and I also trim my beard. I got a, a wall trimmer, W-A-H-L, yes. a, a little wall trimmer that I do at least once or twice a week to keep it nice and trim. I've had this beard. You want to ask me how long I've had the beard? Uh, let me see. <laughs> how long have you had that beard? <laughs> That's a very good question. Yes. Uh, I've had the beard for, uh, I'm guessing, at least 40 years. 40 uh, years. Yeah, I used to shave all the time. I didn't like it, so I grew a beard. In the olden days, uh, it was a reddish beard. Uh, and. Uh, I decided it made me look too young, so I wanted to make myself look older. So uh, I just, I, 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 I've enjoyed the beard well, all these handsome. years. In, at the 1996 uh, 
presidential convention in San Diego, the president of CNN took me for a walk because my beard was beginning to go from red to gray. Uh, and I thought it was making me look older in TV, you want to look younger. And I said uh, to Tom Johnson, who was then the president of CNN, I said, you know, Tom, um, maybe I should shave the beard because it's making me look older. Uh, and he looked at me and said, Wolf, you can't. It's your trademark. If anything, I'm going to take an insurance policy out on that beard. <laughs> During the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm, I was the Pentagon correspondent for CNN. There was only one 24-7 cable news network. That was CNN. I was on the air all day for, for months leading up to the war, then during the air war, the ground war, and everybody saw me, and I became, quote, famous with the beard, so uh, I'm stuck with it. So tell us what time you get up in the morning, what time I, uh, do you go to work, and how do you prepare? Uh, then I, we'll get back yeah, to the beard. I, I get up uh, usually sometime between 6.30 and 6.45 mm. uh, in the morning. Uh, I'll you know, check my... Uh, email, I'll check some, uh, some websites that I want to look at. I've got a, overnight there will have been a ton of uh, stories that CNN has put out. I'll, I'll, I'll review, I'll spend 15, 20 minutes just taking a look to see what's going on. And usually by about 7, uh, 7 15, uh, I'm doing something that I consider to be critical to my health and my journalism. I'm on the treadmill uh, for at least 45 minutes, usually about an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm watching TV, and watching CNN's New Day in the morning to see what's going on, but occasionally I'll check the BlackBerry, check the iPhone. I've got both. I've got the old school BlackBerry, I've got an iPhone 7 Plus. Uh, I, I've, I realized I, I need both for, uh, if you ask me the question, I'll tell you why, but I'm not gonna ask Let me see you. No, 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 don't ask me the question. <laughs> but, but I've got the, all the uh, technology there, so I'll check to see what's going on. Uh, and I'm really, uh, and, and I'll get caught up. I'll flip the channel a little bit. When the news gets boring, I'll check, you know, Sports Center on ESPN a little bit, see what's going on in the world of sports. But, but usually by uh, 8, 8.15, I'm off the treadmill, I'm showering, uh, and I'll have some juice, uh, check in with my wife, see what's going on, see what her plans are. We'll talk a little bit. And I'm out of the house, you know, relatively quickly thereafter. Every morning, uh, we have a 9 a.m. conference call uh, with the president of CNN and the senior producers, all the senior executives, and we review what the big stories are, how we're going to cover it internationally, domestically, our, our digital. Uh, all of the programs will tell us who the, who the guests that we've booked. So we have a, an extensive conference call in the morning. And then uh, I have a separate conference call at 10 a.m. with my 1, one o'clock show that's called Wolf. Uh, and with the producers, we go through what we have in our, in our rundown. And then uh, uh, later I'll meet with the uh, staff of the Situation Room and we'll take a look at what the, what the stories we want to cover that day. And it's, a, it's a collaborative venture. I have ideas, the executive producer, the senior producers, you know, the, the, the junior producers, we all, we all come with ideas. And in the end, uh, I think we put on a pretty good show. So there are lots of things that must happen to you and with you every day, having all the tenure that you've had before the camera and on television. Tell us, about a, um, tell us about an incident or a time or a point in time when you were on television doing your show mm -hmm. and uh, something truly memorable happened. Well, there's been a lot of times. I've been with CNN now, uh, in fact, on May 8th, which I think is Monday, uh, I will be celebrating my 27th year mm. on CNN. So 27 years. I started May 8th, 1990, and you know, there, we, we've had breaking news. We've had, you know, uh, amazing things that have happened, you know, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, you know, very recently, I'll tell you, I'll take you behind the scenes a little bit. Uh, I show the Situation Room, so I'm, uh, it's on at five uh, to seven. At six o'clock. Uh, we have a couple reporters giving us the latest news, and I start an interview with the former Secretary of Defense, the former CIA director, Leon Panetta. Uh, and he was uh, in California, I was in Washington. We're doing this interview, and in the course of the interview, uh, my, uh, my producer, who's in my ear talking to me, I've asked the question, and the Secretary, former Secretary of Defense is answering it. He says, uh, 
Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, wants to do an interview with you. And I said, oh, why is he telling me this now? I mean, I assumed it was going to be tomorrow or the mm -hmm. next day. Uh, and, and I can't talk to him because I'm on the air. Yes. I'm interviewing <laughs> Leon Panetta. So I can, I can hear what he's saying, but I can't say anything. And, and uh, uh, he says, Sean Spicer wants to do an interview with you in five minutes. <laughs> I'm saying, five. Now, as, as you, all, all of you will remember, he caused a huge stir that day when he suggested that even the Nazis weren't using poison gas, mm -hmm. like the Syrians, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and uh, you know, he, it, it caused a, you know, a, big, a big stir, a big problem. Uh, and um, he wanted to come on my show. It was their idea, the White House idea, and to apologize. I didn't know what he wanted to say. I had no idea. Uh, I was surprised that you know, he decided he wanted to do this, uh, you know, this interview with me and with CNN. Uh, and he said uh, he's getting on the north lawn of the White House. They're hooking him up now. Uh, and you'll be ready to go uh, as soon as you know, we check out his microphone and everything, and which took a couple of minutes. At which point I said to uh, the Secretary of, former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, I said, and this is all on live television. I said, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I want you to stand by. Sean Spicer, the White House Press Secretary, is joining us for an interview. He's caused a big commotion today. Uh, please stand by. I'll get your reaction afterwards. But, uh, uh, but I'm going to talk to uh, Sean Spicer. And then I turned to, to Sean Spicer. And he came out and did what you know, was extraordinary uh, for this you know, administration. They rarely admit they made a mistake, rarely apologize. But he, he made a very full-throated, robust apology. He misspoke. He didn't realize the full enormity of what he was saying, uh, you know, comparing, uh, and, you know, at least indirectly, Bashar al-Assad to Hitler. You, know, you don't make those kinds of comparisons. Uh, and uh, he said, I understand. I pressed him. I said, do you know about the gas chambers uh, where Jews and others were sent, and they had Cyclone B, which is a poison gas, which killed? I, I had recently, in the summer of 2014, visited the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, uh, and I saw the gas chambers. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty extraordinary interview. And, and it wasn't something that we had prepared for. It wasn't something that you know, we spent a day or two doing research on. It was just a, an interview. It was a, an important interview. And I was very pleased that he did the right thing. He came on television, and he apologized. And, and he said he, he was wrong. And that's that just a, an example of you know, what happens when you're doing live TV. Sure. How about a time when you've... Uh... You've done something on your show that you wish to God no one would ever remember. <laughs> <laughs> I blocked it out of my mind. You know. There have been so many times when you misp misspeak, you say something you shouldn't say. Uh, in the you know, older days, uh, you know, people wouldn't even pay that much attention. But now with Twitter and social media, you know, if you say something really stupid, it's all over the place right away. And I'm not going to remind you of some of those things. <laughs> uh, but if you, if you go to Google, you'll see them. It's, uh... I actually have a list of them yeah, right I'm here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there have been plenty of examples. You know, what we like to say is, you know, journalism, we're the first draft of history. Uh, and, you know, the first draft is not always perfect. Uh, we try to be as responsible, as fair, and as accurate as we possibly can be, but occasionally you make a mistake. And if you, once you, you realize there's a mistake, you correct it. You go on the air, mm -hmm. and you try to fix it. But, you know, there's, it's, it's the first draft. What would be the most fascinating interviewee that you've had? And you why? know, and I've interviewed all the presidents, uh, 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 all the world leaders. Uh, I would say one of the most moving uh, interviews I did was in 1998. Uh, I went to South Africa, uh, and I spent a day at Robben Island uh, with Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. who was the president of South At that point, he was the president of South Africa. But he had spent, what, 25 years as a prisoner uh, at Robben Island during the apartheid regime. Uh, and he invited me to the uh, presidential residence in Cape Town uh, for an interview. And he didn't do many interviews, but this was an important interview. He knew that CNN was seen not only in the United States, but around the world. He wanted to speak out. Uh, and I wanted to, clearly, I wanted to interview him. And 
he was so amazing because after apartheid, uh, after all the years when the blacks and the coloreds, they have you know, the different categories in South Africa. I've been to South Africa during apartheid. I saw the horrendous situation. And this was now he was the democratically elected president of South Africa. And we spoke. And I had spent time the day before looking at the conditions that he had to survive in uh, all those years. There were a few years in isolation, couldn't speak to anyone. You know, and, uh, and he emerged, what was so remarkable, that Nelson Mandela emerged from that experience, that horrendous captivity. And when he saw what was happening, and apartheid was ending, and he was going to be the leader, uh, no bitterness, no revenge. Uh, he could have you know, said, there's going to be a brutal war. He, he said to the people of South Africa, we need the blacks, we need the coloreds, we need the Asians, we need the white people. We're a new South Africa, we're going to work together and build a new country. And he conveyed that throughout this interview I did with him. Uh, and it was just a moving experience to, to see a world leader who had gone through he, what he went through. Uh, and even at some of the joyous moments of his inauguration, he invited some of those apartheid prison guards who watched over him because he wanted to show that there was a new South Africa. And, and I gave him, a lot of, gave him a lot of credit for what, he, for what he did. It was just a powerful interview, mm. one that I'll never forget. Mm. You know, the uh, vice chairman of the Board of Trustees at High Point University is a man who was good friends with Nelson Mandela and uh, actually brought some of his children uh, to the United States of America to, to study and paid their way in the most trying of times in the Mandela family. Uh, and he has shared many stories with our students on campus about mm -hmm. that regime. So looking forward, who would be the one person you'd w want to interview, you wish you could interview, and why? Uh, well, I'd love to interview the Pope. Uh, but you, know, you can't just call him up and say, hey, Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Want to do an interview? Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, that would be uh, that would be pretty amazing uh, to interview the Pope. Uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was honored uh, to be invited by uh, the Catholic University of America, which is the American university affiliated with the Vatican. Mm. Uh, uh, the president of Catholic, the Catholic University, uh, Father David O'Connell, called me one day and said, uh, "Wolf, uh, the board of trustees, the faculty, the students." we'd like to invite you to give the commencement address at the Catholic University. Uh, and I said to uh, Father David O'Connell, who, who I had met in, over the years in Washington, you know, CNN has a, a big bureau, and, and, and we try to take advantage and help uh, the, the journalism students, whether at Catholic University or Maryland or George Washington or Georgetown or American or, or Howard University, all the schools. Or High Point University. High Point University, a little far away yeah. from, from Washington, but we'd love to have some interns yes. from High Point University. And we were uh, fortunate to have a bunch of High Point University students working with CNN during the Democratic and yes, Republican yes, conventions yes. Uh, this, uh, this past year. Yes. Uh, but uh, he, he invited me to give the commencement address. And I said, but Father O'Connell, you know I'm not Catholic. And he said, yes, we know you're not Catholic. And I said, you know I'm not going to become Catholic. He said, <laughs> he said yes, we know you're not going to become Catholic. I said, well, you can reconsider uh, if you want. And he said, no, 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 we want you. And I, I was blessed. And he, he invited me uh, uh, to meet the Pope when he came to Washington. This was a few years ago. Uh, the bishops were all gathered at Catholic University. And uh, he invited 10 friends of Catholic University to have a private audience mm. with the pontiff. Uh, and he invited me. And I said to him again, Father O'Connell, <laughs> you know I'm not Catholic. Yeah. We went through the whole thing. Uh, but it was a great honor. It was a great thrill. Uh, and uh, I didn't interview the pope. But uh, when I was standing in line uh, waiting uh, for the pope to walk in, uh, Tim Russert, my good friend, the late Tim Russert from NBC, uh, the host of Meet the Press, and my fellow Buffalonian, we're both from Buffalo, New York. Uh, we were standing there. He was one of the friends of Catholic University, too. Now, he was a devout Catholic. He was there. Uh, and uh, 
he, we, we were speaking, and I thought that when the Pope was walking down, shaking hands, uh, Tim would say, Pope, you want to be on Meet the Press this Sunday? No, he didn't. He was, he was like a little choir boy. He, was, he had his rosaries and his Bible, and he was, he was so great. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in going to the Vatican and having a you know, nice conversation. It's, it's something that would be extraordinary. I don't think the, pont is, the, the, you know, the pontiff does a lot of interviews. I'll give you one additional uh, uh, sort of follow-up to that. A few years later, I got a call from the president of Howard University in Washington, D.C. Howard University, historically black mm -hmm. college, excellent school. Uh, and he said, uh, Wolf, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, mm -hmm. we'd like to invite you to give the commencement address and get an honorary degree at Howard University. And my initial instinct, uh, and I immediately said, uh, uh, but uh, Dr. Frederick, Wayne Frederick, uh, you know I'm not black. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes, we know you're not black. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I can become black. <laughs> he said, you can reconsider. And they, they still let me, they gave me an honorary degree, which was really, which was really nice. And I, become, uh, I, I, I was always involved in helping the journalism students at Howard University, working with them. Uh, and, and, and the good ones, and there were plenty, we hired and we gave them opportunities to become journalists at CNN. And, and, some of them, one of my producers today who you know, does all the booking for our guests is a graduate of Howard University. Mm -hmm. So we, we take advantage of this opportunity. So it's just a nice, but that would be one interview that I'd what be What would be the first question you'd ask the Pope? Oh, yeah, it's a tough one. How you doing? You wouldn't look at <laughs> <laughs> What's it like being the Pope? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we, I would do some human interest type questions, but I would also want to get into some substantive, yes. important issues affecting millions of people around the world, and, and try to you know get get his thoughts on what 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 he believes we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. Uh, it would be a substantive, important interview. If he's watching, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you have no plans to become Catholic, so I don't no. think you have a chance at getting the Pope. Um, Undergraduate degree in history, University of Buffalo. State University of New York at Buffalo. Yes. I majored in American history, uh, and uh, it was a, a fabulous experience. Four years uh, at uh, the university, and uh, I really loved history, and, and I loved American history, uh, and, and, I, and I remember vividly uh, when uh, I was a senior and I was in an honors program, one of my professors, Clifton Yearly, who was a, a great uh, historian, uh, asked me what I wanted to do, and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I was a senior. Uh, and uh, he said, I know you're interested in international relations. Why don't you apply to go to the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C.? And I said, well, that sounds pretty cool, but I don't know if I'll get in. He said, why don't you apply? Uh, and uh, he had been a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, got his Ph.D. there. Uh, and to my amazement, I applied and, and was accepted. And that really changed my life, because then I got to Washington. And it was the first time I really spent quality time in the nation's capital. I could see uh, you know, that I was developing what we call Potomac fever. Mm -hmm. I loved politics. I loved government. I loved uh, observing what was going on. And those two years, uh, as I look back on those two years, my undergraduate, uh, experience, but also my graduate school experience, it has so helped me in my career. Almost every day when I'm doing a story, whether involving international affairs or involving international economics uh, or involving uh, uh, history, American foreign policy, uh, you know, some of the some of the stuff I learned has stayed with me in all those in, and throughout you know my my professional career, and I'm so grateful to those professors. Uh, you know, who taught me uh, what information that I really need to know. It was such a fabulous experience. And I'm grateful to my parents, uh, you know, who, who said, you want to go study international relations? They weren't exactly convinced you could make a living in international relations, but they supported me. They believed in education. They believed in higher education. Uh, and I got a master's degree in international relations, and it was just a wonderful experience. And yet you never took a class in journalism. I never did. I never took a class in journalism. 
Uh, I never worked for the school newspaper or the radio station. Uh, I, I fell into journalism uh, when I finished uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. At one point, I was thinking, you know, maybe I would go on and get a PhD. Uh, and I wasn't really, you know, convinced about that. Uh, but uh, somebody recommended, you know, you want to be a foreign correspondent? And I said, hey, yeah, that sounds pretty cool, you know. <laughs> you, you wear a trench coat, you travel around the world. I really wasn't sure what it meant, but uh, I, I applied for a job with the Reuters News Agency in London, a British wire service, and all these years later, I'm still a journalist, mm. and I love it. So Dana Carvey, the comedian, says that uh, you actually made up the name Wolf. <laughs> Uh, In other words, that yeah. was fake news. It's the... It <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to disappoint him, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's the most frequently asked question I get, what's your real name? And uh, is Wolf your real name? And the answer is yes. Wolf is my real name. You can look at my birth certificate. It's not Wolfgang, it's just Wolf. <laughs> uh, and people say, why Wolf? Well, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, his first name was Wolf, uh, and I was named after him. So if you think growing up in Buffalo, New York, uh, with the name Wolf Blitzer was easy, uh, <laughs> but it, 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 was, it was fine. And, and it was a in, great experience. And yet in Buffalo, New York, there is a sports team named after you, the Buffalo Blitzers. That's our, our, our professional soccer team, yeah. so. Uh, you know, blitz, you know, like blitzing linebackers and, you know, it's, blitz means lightning in German. I see. And, and a blitzer is somebody who's, you know, very fast, unlike uh, me. But you love basketball. I, I'm a You're Washington fan, Wizards, fan Washington I'm a Wizards. Washington Wizards season ticket holder, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we love the Washington Wizards. Uh, they're uh, down two to one with the Boston Celtics, mm -hmm. but we're coming back. Uh, you played uh, football in ninth grade. What happened? <laughs> My football career, uh, in my mind, was great, uh, but in reality, it was weak. I played football in high school, uh, and uh, uh, I tried uh, a linebacker. Uh, I wasn't big, I was, wasn't that fast, I wasn't that good, but I loved the sport, uh, and so I played. And uh, uh, when I was a freshman at the University of Buffalo, uh, one day, just before classes started, a, a friend said, you know, the uh, University of Buffalo football team uh, is starting, you know, they're practicing. Uh, and uh, he said he knew somebody who was going to uh, uh, try out, it's sort of a walk-on, what they can just go, go to the team, not a you know, scholarship. And I said, I'm gonna do that too. I, I wasn't good, but I just wanted to see what it was like. So I went and uh, they gave me all the, you know, the the equipment and the jersey and the whole nine yards. And uh, you know, we were doing exercising, we were doing some practicing, and it was a lot of fun, but you know, I wasn't gonna play or anything like that. But uh, the first uh, scrimmage or a sort of practice, not a real game, that we had uh, was uh, against another upstate New York school, Syracuse University, which had a much better football team than we had. We were Buffalo, you know. But it was just a you know, preseason kind of scrimmage. Uh, and so th there was a, a game, and I'm of course on the sidelines. Number, I think I was number 55. Uh, and uh, you know these Syracuse players were amazing. They were great. Our our players weren't that great, and they were doing really well. Uh, but in the second uh, 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 quarter, the coach looks at the sideline, and he's looking for some a, a linebacker. And the number 55 was a number for a linebacker. He had no idea who I was. I had no idea what I was doing there. And uh, he, uh, he, he points at me, 55. And I said, 50, I'm going in? I, I never expected that I would actually. <laughs> so here I am, I'm looking in the backfield of the Syracuse University. Uh, and in those days, by the way, uh, you know, freshmen could only play other freshmen. It wasn't, the freshmen couldn't play varsity yet. It was just freshman team. And I'm looking in the backfield and it's, I see these big guys. And I'm saying to myself, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> and then I look in the backfield and I see a running back uh, who's staring at me, big guy. And, and then I see him 
uh, before they go down in their stance. And I see him take his fingers and point at me. <laughs> he, he goes like this. I go like this. <laughs> and uh, they give him the ball, of course. And what does he do? He starts running right at me. <laughs> and I'm like the sort of left linebacker. He's running right at me. And I have to make, at that second, a life and death decision. <laughs> do I actually try to tackle him, or do I pretend to sort of fall down? <laughs> of course, I pretended and fell down. <laughs> and he scored a touchdown. Uh, I go to the sideline, and all the players there are coming over, all my Buffalo players, coming over to me and saying, Wolf, you know who that was? And I said, no. That's somebody who's going to be an amazing star. And I said, well, what's his name? Floyd Little. <laughs> Syracuse University went on to become an NFL star with the Denver Broncos, NFL Hall of Fame, great player. And uh, I said, OK, makes me feel better that uh, <laughs> I didn't try to tackle him. All right, so fast forward about 25 years, right? Fast forward 25 years. Uh, I'm giving a speech. Uh, in Denver, Colorado, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and it was a big event. Uh, and uh, after the speech, uh, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations says, I'd like you to meet some of our friends. And he introduces me. And there, a very distinguished man with a suit uh, is introduced to me and says, and this is Floyd Little, who's an executive with the Denver Broncos. I said, Floyd. You almost killed me. <laughs> and and I, I, I reminded him of the incident. <laughs> and he said to me, oh, I used to do that all the time. I used to <laughs> intimidate. And I said, well, I made, the, I made the right. I said, that moment always will stand out in my mind. You probably don't even remember it. But it was, it was a nice moment yes. to just remember. I, I realized at that moment that uh, I was not going to be an NFL star. Uh, and that was the end of my football career. I you know, played for one play in, uh, as a freshman at the University of Buffalo, and then I retired uh, uh, as, as, as a freshman. But ask me this question. Hold, hold tight, hold okay. tight. Okay. Go. Ask me this question. Well, well, Wolf, what about your basketball career? Uh, I'm not really interested, but if you want. If you... <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Uh, when I was in ninth grade or eighth grade, uh, I realized, and I told this story once. I was interviewing Shaquille O'Neal on my show, uh, who's a very nice guy, and I'm a huge basketball fan. Uh, and during a commercial break, uh, I said to him, you know, Shaq, I really loved playing basketball. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really my sport. He said, how'd you know? I said, well, I said, you know, and I, I could dribble with my right hand, but I really wasn't very good dribbling with my left hand. And he said, what else? I said, well, I said, well, you know, I was sort of slow. I really wasn't that fast. And he said, okay, what else? And I said, well, you know, my shooting was not that strong. <laughs> he said, it really helps to be 7'4", or whatever. <laughs> you know, he was very sympathetic yes. to me. He became a huge star, uh, but you know, he, he, he was so nice. Mm. But that was the end of my career. I wanted to be center fielder for the New York Yankees. That didn't happen. But you know what? It turned out OK. Yes. Yeah, I can't complain. I'd say it turned yeah. out OK. So you made $4,600 in winnings on Jeopardy. <laughs> Do you remember the question? I was on Jeopardy that... twice. Once I did well, once I did terrible. Let's talk about the time you did well. What was the question that oh, got you over the who, top? Who knows? You remind me. So you cheated. No, I didn't cheat. <laughs> the problem with Jeopardy uh, is uh, that you, know, you have to push that button. Yeah. But you can't push the button until you know, he a finishes asking the question. Mm -hmm. So if you push the button while he's still asking the question, you're disqualified because it takes it like 15 seconds or whatever to you know, reboot it or whatever. So uh, you really have to learn how to use that. And, and that was another problem I had. I wasn't all that good in pushing that button. What did you do with the $4,600? I probably gave it away to charity. 
Oh, come on. I did. That's what I usually do. You were rich then? I wasn't rich, but I, 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 I like to give money to charity, to good causes. Okay, let me give you my card, because <laughs> High Point University is a 501c3. <laughs> you get a tax my, deduction my on this. My mother and father always said, what goes around comes around. Yes, indeed. And they taught me to be indeed. charitable. I, I always thought, you know what, you give the money away, yes. it'll come back to you in other ways. At our baccalaureate service this afternoon for our graduates, the speaker actually made that point that Significance and success in life come to those who lose themselves in service, and charity is part yeah, of service. Your mom, Seisha, lives in Florida. She just turned 95 years old. You write a lot about her influence in your life. Tell us more about your mom. My mom and my dad. Uh, my dad died, unfortunately, uh, when he was 82, 80, almost 82 years old. Uh, but my mom's still, still around, and she's living in Hollywood. She's still living in her apartment. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's next weekend we're all going to go down to see her for Mother's Day. Uh, and uh, it's, she's a, just a wonderful woman. Uh, my mother, like my father, they're both Holocaust survivors. Uh, they survived World War II in slave labor camps. Uh, they lost their parents and so many other relatives. Uh, and then uh, they uh, uh, wound up in Buffalo, New York, of all places. And the reason they did, and I'll, if you have a second, I'll tell you sure, the story, sure. uh, it, which is true. Uh, my dad, in 1945, at the end of the war, uh, you know, he was frail, you know, he had gone through uh, hell, uh, and my mother too, and uh, after, the, after the war, uh, they did what all the young survivors did. My dad was 25, my mother was 22. Uh, they got on uh, trains and started looking to see if, who their relatives and their friends survived, especially their parents. Did their parents survive? And, and they just went, you know, went around and they, they were liberated in Poland, but they found, made their way to Germany. Uh, uh, and they were looking for you know, information about their, their loved ones. So my mom and dad met on a train. Uh, and amazingly, within three days, they fell in love. Uh, and in those days, my dad used to say, you know, we didn't know what's going to happen next week or the week after. So they quickly got married. Uh, and uh, they were in, in a town called Augsburg, Germany which was in the U.S. zone, the U.S. military zone, and the U.S. military was there. Uh, and a, a U.S. Army chaplain, a rabbi, married them in Augsburg. Uh, and uh, my mother survived. Uh, she had one sister who survived, two brothers. My dad only had one sister who survived. Uh, his other sisters and brothers didn't, parents didn't. Uh, and uh, my mother had played such a significant role in saving uh, her younger sister and two brothers they were in this uh, slave labor camp in Skarzysku. I, I, I did a whole piece about this that aired on CNN a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Jeff Zucker, the president of CNN, asked the, the main anchors to do a piece about their family history uh, and their heritage, their roots, and we all did it. And, and I did it. If, if you're interested, you can go to Google, look up Wolf Blitzer Roots, and you can watch this piece about my family's history. But to make a long story short, uh, my mother was a courageous woman uh, who struggled and, and helped uh, her family, her, her brother, two brothers and one sister survive. And then uh, my parents wound up in Buffalo, New York, and I'll tell you how they did it. Uh, in, right after the war in 45, uh, President uh, Truman uh, got through Congress what was called the Displaced Persons Act in 1945, 46, uh, which granted 400,000 visas for displaced persons to come to the United States, immigrants. Uh, and a lot of Holocaust survivors uh, you know, were part of those 400,000. And my dad one day was in Munich, which is not far from Augsburg. And uh, he uh, saw a long line in Munich. And in those days, he would often say to me, you see a long line, you go wait in line. There must be something good at the end of the line. <laughs> Why are all these people waiting in line? So uh, he goes to the end of the line. Uh, and then about a half an hour into this line, he's waiting there, he's waiting. He sees a woman in front of him and he says, Fräulein, uh, why are we waiting in line? And she says, visas. And my dad said, visas for what? America. My dad said, visas for America? They're giving visas for America. My dad didn't believe it, but he waited in the line, signed himself up, it's my mother you know, her, her brothers and sister, my, my dad's one sister, 
Uh, and within a few months, they got uh, a letter saying, you've been approved to come to the United States, uh, and you're going to Buffalo, New York. They would tell you where you were mm. being relocated. Mm. And my dad said, Buffalo, where's that? And they said, New York. And my, da my dad thought it was New York. <laughs> he didn't know 400 miles away it was Buffalo. Uh, but they came to Buffalo, and uh, you know, it was a, a wonderful experience. The community, Jewish community, the non-Jewish community was so receptive. I, they would tell me to these uh, displaced persons, the new refugees, immigrants who had come uh, to Buffalo, and they helped my dad. My dad got a job, which he hated, uh, at Bethlehem Steel. It was an awful job, and he left. Then he and uh, his brother-in-law opened up a little deli. He hated that. Uh, uh, and so he had two friends, two brothers in New Jersey, uh, who similarly you know, were sent to Elizabeth, New Jersey. And uh, they uh, went into the home building business, started building homes. And they said to my dad, Dave, you know, you're a smart guy. Buy some land, start building some homes. All these GIs are coming home. They need housing. Uh, you'll do well. And so my dad, who was a gutsy kind of guy, smart guy, he started uh, buying a lot here, a lot there, started to buy some acres here and there, and started building homes. And he had a couple partners uh, and great help. And uh, you know, he and his partners eventually became one of the largest you know, single family home builders in Western New York and, and did really well. So it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful, you know, opportunity. The community, you know, you know welcomed him, uh, and he took advantage. And you know, and, and America is a great country. Yes, indeed. You once said the problem with the 20th century was not that it was the century of war, but rather that it was the century of unlearned lessons. What do you mean by that? Well, we went from war to war to war. People didn't learn the lessons from you know World War One to World War Two to the Korean War, to the Vietnam War, and we're still fighting wars right now. Unfortunately, you know, people are brilliant and smart and wonderful, but they don't learn the lessons that you know, war is, is a horrendous, horrendous thing, and, you know, and it's still going on. And it's a, it's, it's a, as someone who's been a war correspondent and has seen uh, the awful side of war, it's just you know, a terrible, terrible thing. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't, those are the un, unlearned lessons. Unlearned lessons, yes, among others. Yeah. Um, you have been in, at CNN 27 years? As of Monday. And more years beyond, before that in journalism. Let me ask you, there's so much talk today among all kinds of people that the media is biased. What is your response to that? Well, there's bias in the media. Some media are you know, more biased than others. Some you know, from the left, others from the right. I can only speak as an you know, old school journalist who started with Reuters many years ago. And these, these British uh, journalists would always say, look, you report the news. You report the news as honestly, as fairly, as responsibly, as factually as you, you can. Uh, nobody cares what you think. You've got to tell the readers. Uh, what, what is important, and you got to uh, just do it in a fair and responsible way. And they said, and if you're going to report something negative about someone, before you do that, talk to that person. Get that person's response. Uh, because once you report it, that person's reputation could be smeared. And if it's inaccurate, that's going to that's gonna hover over that person. So always give the aggrieved party in any story an opportunity to make his or her case and explain. And, and we do that. We try to be as responsible and as fair as we possibly can be. Now, sometimes people don't like it because you know, the news is not necessarily something that is you know, going to be positive for them. But you know, our mission, certainly our mission at CNN, is to report the news as responsibly and as fairly as we can. But journalists are human beings. You're yeah. a human being. You have your own frame of reference, your own upbringing, your own feelings about life and people and events and situations. Uh, how, do you, how do you control your own biases? It's, it's, it's a great question, and, and we all you know, are human beings. You're absolutely right. We have our own biases. If you're a professional journalist, though, as I am, I try to forget about that. I may think this policy is great, this policy is terrible. I may think this person is a wonderful politician, this person is a terrible. 
you try to block that out. No, it's not a perfect science. As much as you possibly can, and just report the news as honestly as you can without you know, letting uh, your personal bias you know, play, play as a factor. It's not always easy. It's not always possible. Some journalists do it better than other journalists. Now, there are some journalists who, you know, who are excellent journalists but are opinionated journalists. And you know they're coming from the left, they're coming from the right, and, and that's fine. In Europe, opinionated journalism is much more accepted than it has been here in the United States, but it's, it's growing, especially with social media now, uh, and uh, I have no problem with that. I come from that old school where, you know, I'm not the story, I just report the news as honestly as I can. The Pew Research Center says less than two in 10, less than two in 10, trust the information from media. What brings that on and what is the press doing about it? Well, the only thing that we can do about it is continue to do what we do, report the news uh, and, uh, and, and tell those stories that are important. Uh, and you know what? Uh, sometimes people will be happy with what we report. Sometimes they won't be happy with what we report. But I can't deal with you know, public opinion mm. polls about, you know, my attitude is I'm going to report the news as honestly as I can. And, and I think my staff in the Situation Room, uh, we, we, you know, we're really devoted to that. And sometimes people will like it. Sometimes they won't like it. And if they don't like it, they usually start saying, oh, fake news, blah, 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 something like that. But it's, you know, I, I can't worry about that. Uh, at Hype University, we have a thriving school of communication. It has about 800 students who are majoring in some form of communication, journalism, et cetera. What would be, uh, if this were a, uh, a communication class, a media class, a journalism class, what would be the two or three pieces of advice that you might give them? The most important advice I give all young aspiring journalists, uh, whether they're interns at CNN or whether they come visit CNN or they just want to talk to me, the most important advice I give them is the same advice I would give somebody who wants to be a cellist. Practice. Practice, practice, practice. The same advice I would give someone who wants to be a tennis player. Practice, practice, practice. You want to be a journalist, you want to be a reporter, you got to get out there and practice. You got to start writing, you got to start editing, you got to start videotaping, you got to start doing it. Not just talking about it, thinking about it, get interns, work for the school newspaper, or the school radio or TV station, just start doing it, reporting, 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 uh, and learning in the process and seeing what your t professors say, what your editors say, and try to improve those skills every single day. Uh, and if you, if you do that, uh, that's a good way to start. Now, journalism is not for everyone. You know, some people may think it's a fabulous, great career, but once they get into it, they realize they're not meant to be in journalism, which is fine. There are plenty of other wonderful careers to engage in, but if, uh, if this is something that you really want to do, it's, it, I, you know, I feel blessed that I do it. I get up every day and at between 6.30 and 6.45 a.m. Uh, and before I get on that treadmill, I think about how blessed I am that I can uh, you know, get, get out there and, and do what I do. Do you trim the beard before the no, treadmill? No, I trim the beard after the after treadmill. The treadmill. Yes, okay, after the treadmill. Okay, that's a good piece of advice. Yes. Um, your wife is a gardener and... Interested? Now that is fake news. My wife That's is, fake news. Now my wife has never gardened in her life. Well, she's a, she's into flower, flowers. No, my wife uh, is a personal shopper at Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. She's been working at Saks uh, for a um, long time, uh, and so if uh, if your beautiful wife has a big occasion and she needs a wonderful a gown or dress or something, yeah. she can come visit my wife and they can take a look at... Would she get you know, a discount? They can talk about Oscar or Armani, you know. Uh, they can talk about So that. your wife is I've, not... No, my wife is not a gardener. And, How uh, many times have you been married? Once. <laughs> so my... You, are you sitting here telling in front of all my friends yeah. that the president of Hypo University is wrong? 
on this, only on this one ah, issue. Okay, uh, all right. It's okay. You I have mean, a, she does love flowers. I see. And she, you know, we, we but have that's flowers. that's not her thing. But that's not her passion yeah, yeah. or her excitement. Okay, your daughter is a journalist with NBC? No, that's not true. <laughs> is your name not Tom Brokaw? No. <laughs> oh. I picked up the wrong book, yeah. darn it. My daughter uh, um, graduated from Emory University in Atlanta. Yes. And it was not that long ago when the, the parents who are here for this wonderful commencement at High Point University, I could totally relate yes. the excitement going through that moment when you realize your child has, yes. is graduating from college and all that effort, all that struggle. It's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Uh, when she was uh, in, between her junior and senior year, uh, she got an internship in New York at Self Magazine, which is a Condé Nast magazine in the beauty department. Mm -hmm. She takes after her mother more than she takes after uh, her father, and she loved the, uh, that experience. And then she was lucky, they liked her, so when she graduated, she got a job as a beauty assistant, editorial assistant at Self Magazine. And in the, in the course of that, you know, uh, she realized that a lot of her friends said, if you don't, in the, in the women's magazine business, if you don't move out, you don't move up. So she went from uh, Self Magazine to Family Circle Magazine, uh, then to Health Magazine, which is a women's magazine, a, a Time Inc. publication. And she's, you know, she's done very well. She's she was really, writing, editing, or? Writing and editing. Well, then I'm half right. Yeah. In, 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 in beauty. The only wrong thing I had was that she worked at NBC. No, she never but, worked at NBC. Okay, so, I'll take that, yeah. but. I'll give you one, you give me one. She, Are we equal? She might watch NBC. Okay. okay. <laughs> she watched. I knew NBC was involved somehow. I'm helping you. I'm okay, helping you. thank you very much. Um, let me see. Madame Marie Curie once said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. What is the eureka moment for you in terms of understanding? As much as I love all the current events and the politics and the international affairs and the relations, international relations and the national security issues. You know, when all is said and done, uh, family is so important. Uh, and you always have to real, that's number one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's over the years, I've definitely come to appreciate that so much. Uh, you know, I've got a lovely, wonderful family uh, and I feel so blessed that you know, those family moments, we should cherish them, take advantage of them, uh, enjoy them. Uh, because I've realized as, as you get older, and I'm sure you realize as well, life is short. You know, you're gonna have you know, not that many opportunities. So take advantage of that family experience. Love it, appreciate it, and, and that's great. What is the most difficult thing you do every day? The most difficult thing in terms of my professional? In terms of your life. Well, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, I'm not like Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's a neurosurgeon, mm. who's going to go and save somebody's life in a 12-hour operation in someone's head. Uh, you know, that's a life-saving moment that, that is difficult. You know, journalism is not that difficult. So, you know, it's not brain surgery or anything like that. So I, the most difficult things are making sure we have the story accurate, making sure that we decide what is going to lead the show, the most important news of the day, that's, you know, we lead the situation room with that, uh, and that we do it in a fair and responsible way. It's not easy. As I said, it's not brain surgery. It's not easy, but that is, you know, it's difficult, and it comes with experience. I've been a, a journalist for a long time, and so you have gut instincts. You know, what is really important on this day? What isn't important? And, and I try to focus it on the important news. Mm -hmm. it's, not an easy, it's not an easy job. You know the fun thing about doing these interviews, and I've done about 20 of them now with... And you've done an excellent job. Well, thank you, sir. Um, is that you get to know a person a little bit better when you just chit-chat about life and things. I never thought you were funny until I met you today. <laughs> I know. I, so a lot of people, you know, because I'm not telling jokes in the Situation Room. I'm not laughing, uh, although yesterday, uh, when uh, we heard uh, after the vote on the uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare and it passed narrowly 217 to 213, uh, some of the Democrats on this floor of the House of Representatives started singing, na 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 na, 
You know that song? Yes. Can you sing it for us? When the cameras are off, okay. you and I will <laughs> we'll do a duet, you so, and I. Uh, so uh, I had my panel of you know, uh, our political experts, and, uh, and the Democrats were sort of singing that song to taunt the Republicans, you voted for this, but it's gonna come back and haunt you. So they were singing you know, that, that song, and I started singing it a little bit on the show, uh, just sort of like that. Yeah. And the panel started laughing, and it got, you know, it got some buzz out there. I'm not a good singer. You're not a good singer, you're not a good football no. player, you... <laughs> You don't shave every day, my, my God. I love to watch football and I love to watch basketball <laughs> and I love music. And we're delighted that you came to visit us on the campus of High Point University. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wolf Blitzer. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.